This video goes to show that no matter what the object is, it's instantly made cooler when you put it on tracks. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with another model showcase video for this 135th scale Soviet B4 M1931 203mm howitzer. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built predominantly out of the box, however I went ahead and made some changes to some of the components, replacing the stock ones with some aftermarket bits. We'll be going over all of these modifications in this video, as well as going over the kit's features, and last but not least, I'll be giving this model a thorough inbox review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this is the Russian M1931 B4 203mm howitzer. The B4 was the Soviet Union's heavy artillery piece. This thing was utilized by the Red Army during the World War II time frame. The unit was originally designed in the interwar years in 1931, entered into production the following year, and stayed in full production up until the end of the war in 1945. In total throughout its entire production life, about 871 units were produced. These units saw widespread service with the Red Army during World War II from the early stages all the way up to the very end. The unit was considered a heavy artillery piece and weighing in at over 3,900 pounds, it definitely lends itself to that. The caliber of this unit was 203 millimeters and it can hurl a 220 pound shell of high explosives at a range of about 11 miles. The most eye-catching and unique aspect of the B4's design was with its suspension. Unlike the other heavy artillery pieces which were utilized by both the Axis and the Allies where they had a wheeled carriage, the B4 utilized a fully tracked suspension system. This was definitely a very unique approach because the unit was completely unpowered. It was just a standard towed artillery piece, but it utilized the tracks rather than the wheels. The purpose of this was due to the sheer weight of this unit. The Russians did not want this thing to sink into the dirt, and by distributing the weight over the tracks was a way to prevent this. Outside of the tracked aspect, the remainder of the unit was actually fairly traditional. It utilized a two-part ammunition system where you both had the projectile as well as the propellant, which would have been loaded separately in bags. You had a interrupted screw type breech design, again, much along the lines as found on the contemporary units from other countries, and it had a hydro pneumatic recoil dampening system. The unit itself was also experimented by the Soviets by trying to mate it onto other propelled versions, like other chassis, like a KV-1 uh, comes to mind. However, they just never really worked in practice, and the unit always stayed in its uh, towed configuration like you see here. As I mentioned before, the unit saw widespread service with the Red Army during World War II, and many units were captured by the Germans earlier on, and the Germans actually pressed these into service with their own military. After World War II, however, the unit was, I presume, showing its age because after the war, the Russians basically ceased production, and the units were eventually retired shortly thereafter. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea of what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale Trumpeter Soviet B4 203mm howitzer kit. This model here is another one of my stash inhabitants and was picked up about six, maybe seven years ago. It doesn't really have any surface dust on it per se like some of the other models on the lineup because it was actually sitting upward kind of like a book and that's where you'll see the majority of the dust. However, this kit here is actually one that I always wanted to get my hands on and was always just a vehicle I always basically wanted to see represented in a model kit form. 
Me personally, I always had an admiration for this howitzer and it's something that always captivated my attention since I originally saw footage of these units in operation when I was a little kid. Back in the day, whenever you would turn on the History Channel or some other World War II documentary and they're talking about the Battle of Berlin, the B4 howitzer was always a clip of footage that they would loop in and it looked awesome. This was the, the howitzer that you would always see in those old footage where it's on a Berlin street and it's just direct firing, leveling a building that was directly in front of it. And it just looks so different and unique compared to all the other vehicles. The, you know, it's not every day you get to see a giant artillery piece on a tracked wagon. And then when the thing goes off, it's known to just roll backwards as we've all seen in that iconic footage. Not only was my attention grasped by the footage of this thing shooting in all those footages, but I also had the opportunity to see the real one that was housed in the Aberdeen Proving Ground collection back in 2008 when I visited the museum. I believe the unit might still or may or may not still be there, but regardless, I was able to see this thing in person and it does not disappoint. It is massive and just as cool in person as it is when you see it in the photographs or in the old newsreel clips that were on TV. So again, this was one of those models that I always wished would come out in a plastic kit form. And again, it's one of those models that always seem to eluded the major plastic modeling manufacturers. Fast forward until 2009. When Trumpeter announced this kit here, this was really huge news because there were many other people that shared my interest with having this model here added to their collection. And again, there was a huge void in the market for this particular vehicle or artillery type. And this was something that was going to be greatly appreciated. However, like with everything, when it rains, it pours because it wasn't just Trumpeter who entered into the marketplace at the same time with this kit here. There was another variant of the B4 howitzer that was released in 135th scale kit form from the Russian company Allen. And what seems to be a story that's all too common whenever I do a kit history review like this one here, there's always more than one entry at a given time, despite there being a complete lack of them for almost two decades prior. And of course, when the two model kits came out at the same time, no less, there was undoubtedly going to be a little bit of 1v1 and to see exactly which kit was better than the other. Which ultimately means people are going to be complaining and arguing with each other on a bunch of forums and chat rooms. Now, sadly, I don't have the Allen kit in my collection, or at least not yet anyhow. At some point in time, I would like to pick one of those up. However, for the time being, we're just going to stick with the Trumpeter release that we have here. So the Trumpeter release was an interesting release from them, basically, again, because of the vehicle type, and also because at this time, Trumpeter was really getting into releasing kits from the World War II period. As I mentioned with the Dicker Max video, or I'm sorry, the Sturher Emil video, before the mid-2000s time frame, Trumpeter was primarily known as a model company that produced primarily modern era military vehicles. T-55s, Type 59s, things along that route. Well, that all really changed in 2006 when they went ahead and released the Sturher Emil. Once the Sturher Emil came out and it was a hugely popular kit, and again, it was very well executed, I recommend checking that video out in case you're curious on that, that basically put their foot in the door and then they expanded immensely into the World War II market. This vehicle here was one of the kits that immediately followed the mid-2000 releases. And obviously since then, Trumpeter has widely expanded their range and not just World War II military vehicles, but they've also went ahead and expanded the line even to 116. But that's obviously another video for another day. Back to the example that we have here. This model here is all made with modern, or at the time, modern technology and modern mold tooling, which means the detailing on here is going to be excellent. And I have thumbed through some of the kit components over the years, checking the piece out. As I mentioned before, this was a stash inhabitant, and I did take a quick little sneak peek here there just to see exactly what I'll be getting into when the day comes when I finally start it, which is going to be pretty imminent now. Because these are Trumpeter kits, they are fairly easily combined. Trumpeter does have some pretty good kit distribution, and you can still find these with relative ease on any online source, be it from Amazon, eBay, or any other type of online type vendor. Generally, these kits run anywhere between 50 some odd US dollars all the way up to about 75 or 80 
judging or depending whether or not you pay for shipping and other factors along those lines. Regardless, they are basically in line and on an average price with several other contemporary plastic model kits from the modern era. Another thing to point out that this kit was also recycled Pit Road, where they took the exact same kit and they added some extra features to it, namely some extra photo etch and some other extra add-ons in order to improve the kit further from what the original or 2009 tooling gives you. However, this one here is the original release from Trumpeter from the 2009 era. Another thing I do want to point out that the components for the B4 howitzer were then recycled by Trumpeter themselves and they made the self-propelled version where they made this on top of one of their excellent KV-1 kits. However, that's obviously also a topic for another video for another time. Back to the model that we have here. I believe this one was procured by my father actually. He picked it up. He's also a huge fan of this of this artillery piece. He picked it up from eBay or no, he picked it up from Squadron Mail Order back in again like six or seven years ago. So about time I go ahead and actually get to it. So starting with the box art and graphic design, here we have the box art of the Trumpeter B4 Howitzer. I gotta say the box art is, how do we put it? Oh, let me just uh, take a page from Comrade Dyalatov. Not great, not terrible. And that's basically my consensus as well. The box art is decent, it's not the best, and it's definitely not the worst. I've seen some other box arts over my time working in this hobby where some of them are, yeah, you know, they, they could have done a little bit better, uh, <coughs> old school academy ones. Um, but this one here, it's far from being able to compare with something like from Tamiya or Dragon or Tacom. For Tacom, I think that's some of the best. That Jason guy is really, really good. Regardless, here we have the setting here. It is a painterly relief where the B4 is rendered out, but it's a, you know, a bit of a softer type illustration compared to some of the more photorealistic type illustrations that we I mentioned from the other makers. But the setting is somewhat action-packed. We have the B4 right here front and center. It appears it's going through its reloading period, and we have another one there in the background letting rip. It is a winter type setting, and outside of this one here firing a shell, it's a mostly peaceful type setting. The remainder of the graphic design is with this type of format here, and this type of layout is what we would see on trumpeter kits from the late 2000s time frame, and this is basically the same format that they continue to use today. Before this era here, trumpeter was all over the place with the type of graphic design and type of typography that they were using on their box arts. If you check out my Stir Her Meal video, you'll know exactly what I'm referring to. However, since that, or I should say since this period here, they've basically all had the same format. White background box art, the information is, is, is in this gray little rectangle over here. This is the typeface that is generally used. And the Trumper logo is right there in the upper right hand corner. Taking us to the side tabs, here we have a thumbnail of the illustration. Again, that same info I mentioned before, but in that gray box. Same is true for the reverse side. On this portion over here, we have some corporate info, as well as some sample thumbnails of the actual built model itself. And on the reverse side here, we have a little brief history of the model in question. And we have a nice little illustration, as well as also a little snippet here of photo etch. You see, this model here does include, out of the box, with a fret of photo etch. Now, like I mentioned before, Pit Road would go ahead and take this tooling here and enhance it further, would give it even more photo etch. However, the original Trumpeter release does have a fret of photo etch here for some basic components, which you'll see once I crack the box open. As you can see, this one here is dated for 2009, when the unit was originally released, and they were uh, distributed by Stevens International. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but older kits here, that was generally the, con the distributor that I remember seeing from the other kits I worked on. So, opening up the box, we'll reveal the kit's contents. This is not supplied with the kit, but I'll touch upon that momentarily. Okay, so, if anyone has seen the stir her meal video, it's basically the exact same quality of tooling, which is, needless to say, very nicely done. The model is molded in this gray plastic material, and the plastic is a nicely molded material where you get some nice detail, crisp moldings out of it, and you'll see that once I actually crack, or <laughs> rip open the bags. With the first runner removed from the bag here, you get a better idea on what the kit supplies you with. So, hopefully the camera gets into focus, and you can see all of the details found in this 
section over here. And I gotta say, after seeing the real one, this one here is a dead ringer. This thing is just jam-packed full of rivets. The whole thing is just one giant riveted monster. In addition to the rivets, we also have some hatches, or I believe those are some kind of access panels to get onto the inside. All the details are nice and crisp. Everything is properly rendered out, and it looks absolutely great. I have no doubt in my mind that once this thing gets painted and I go in there with the panel line accents, it's just going to make it shine. Here we have some side sections. And again, lots of rivets are integrally molded on all these components. If you're a guy who loves the M3 Lee or just boilerplate type things, this model here is definitely going to be recommended for you. Getting a little ahead of myself, but... The next bag has some other runners in it, and it looks like they're very fragile because they integrally wrap these parts here with styrofoam. No idea what they are, but we'll find out momentarily. Before I do though, this runner here consists of the majority of the howitzer components for the top portion. We have the breech, the barrel assembly, which is in several components. I believe this is probably the recuperator, a very large one at that. Several gear elevation type systems. And a few other doodads and gizmos that undoubtedly I'll find out once I actually start snipping parts off. The barrel is a two-part assembly, which again is quite customarily seen on these plastic model kits. There is an aftermarket set out there that replaces this one here with a turned aluminum one, so if you don't want to deal with the seam removal, that is a option to obtain. However, for this kit here, you know, I've done more seam removals than I could actually think of and count, so I think I should be able to manage with this one here. The breech definitely has that distinctive shape to it, where it's just this rounded off rectangle. Again, if you ever saw the real one, you'll know exactly what I'm referring to. And for this runner, I could see some sections of the carriage right over there. Again, lots and lots of rivets. It appears to be some other parts of the uh, suspension. Let me go ahead and carefully cut this. Whatever it is, they really wanted it to be very carefully packed, which is, by the way, good on Trumpeter, or at least on this release over here. And what the bubble wrap was protecting were the little nubs on the, what appears to be the elevation gear stem. Apparently that is a very fragile component, which is why they deemed to wrap it with the bubble wrap. And the same thing with this other linkage type system over here. The runner does have these other protruding pegs sticking out of it. These are just probably to act as guards just to prevent anything from crushing up against a component. Again, overall, quality is excellent on this kit over here. By the way, I recommend if you get one of these kits to remove the styrofoam like I did just now with a scissor. If you just try to peel it off from the tape or try to rip it in half with your hands, you could potentially cause damage to the parts, which is kind of the opposite intent of with the way these things are packaged. With that other piece of styrofoam removed, you could really get to see the complex geometry found in this piece over here. And yep, this thing is basically a dead ringer from the real example that I saw. The next bag contains two identical runners and they're just simply doubled up. These runners consist of, I presume, components that they're going to be duplicates of, which is why the necessity of two the exact same type of sprues, where we have the idlers, the sprocket, which is funny because it's not propelled, so, but it still has a, a drive, technically a drive sprocket. We have the seat guard, which is this little section right here. They have anti-crush sections on these areas, just like on the other runner as well as the little carriage for the artillery shell. And that's just ones I recognize offhand. Oh, uh, of course we also have some wheels which are funny because they kind of look like miniature KV-1 wheels. Makes sense. The detailing on all the crank wheels looks excellent. All the holes are drilled out as per the moldings. You don't have to go in there and fiddle around with a pin vise in order to hollow them out. Everything is ready to go from the get-go. I'll get to that runner momentarily. And this brings us to this runner over here, which is a fairly, it's a 
substantial size parts that are present on this one. Let's go ahead and get this guy open up. And this bag contains the rear portion of the carriage. So in addition to the unit being tracked, it also has these two gigantic wagon type wheels that are found on the rear portion. We have some more sections of the rear portion of the carriage itself. Again, everything is nicely riveted. All fasteners are present. And the wheels themselves are also equally as nicely detailed. This sprue over here consists of the actual carriage where the track system will be arranged on. And those are just the parts I just recognized. There's a bunch of other components on here that I'm sure again will all come into their into light as what their purpose is as the build commences. I do know these here are the brakes, I can tell you that much. And yes, I did mess with them on the one in Aberdeen. They were rusted shut, but you know, it was fun trying to jiggle them. The next bag contains another nicely tooled bit of equipment and it loops back to those wagon wheels I touched upon before and that is the actual tires. The wheels have rubber tires on them. Solid rubber tires, but rubber tires nonetheless. And the kit gives you real rubber tires for this. Again, excellent bit of tooling. This is something they could easily have just done in standard plastic, but the fact they went with a rubber tooling for this shows just how nicely engineered this kit really is. The tires do have the appropriate thread pattern on them and everything is just excellently rendered. And this leads us to the final bit and honestly, this is something that was the biggest disappointment that this kit does have and it's one that if anyone's a fan of the channel, you'll know exactly what I'm gonna be talking about in the next scene. This kit, as you can see, is beautiful. It is excellent. It's The subject matter is sublime. The execution appears to be top notch. Everything is really, really good. And then we get to the tracks. Guess what? They went with static individual Lincoln length. And as we know, I don't like these at all. I hate them. I really, really hate these goddamn tracks. And uh, talk about flubbing a nearly perfect release. And this was, by the way, at the time when Trumpeter started to mix these type of horrible things with their other kit releases. And this is something that they still do today. A lot of their current releases, be it from Soviet era armor, tend to give you these God awful things for one reason or another and as we know they are absolutely dog crap They're garbage and they are a sure bit way to ruin your model And uh, by the way if you're wondering well, that's okay I'll just get the Allen one or the later Reeboks Eastern Express version You're not doing yourself any favors because they went with the exact same track method. I know it's terrible It's just that's just the way it is sometimes You know, it's like th these things are the general herpes of armor models they go in and out of style, People, uh, they give them, people hate them, even though they claim they don't, you'll have some elitists say, oh, they're gonna, uh, they're people, real people can't stand these things. Then they go ahead and swap them out for workable ink or rubber, and then for some reason they get lazy, and they go back to these god-awful things. They're garbage, I really can't wait to the day when the hobby finally turns again, and they get rid of these things. So I'm not even gonna dignify them with a response, I'm gonna wing them on the other side of my display area over here, because I don't even wanna see them. In their place, fortunately, there are aftermarket solutions to correct this issue. This is one of the options right here from Fruly. If anyone's a fan of the channel, you'll know that I've utilized Fruly track links on a number of other builds in the past, and they are always highly recommended. These tracks here are first and foremost workable, which is awesome, and they are also made out of metal, which for a track like the one here on the B4 is actually going to be really, really appreciated because it gives you a nice natural sag that these tracks just ooze whenever you see them in person. So this is something that's really going to be useful and utilized on this build. 
As for going into the actual tracks themselves, I'm not really going to go too much in depth with in this video about that because I have a whole video just focusing on these tracks, their own review, as well as an assembly video showing exactly how these things get assembled, painted, and then fitted to the model. This is going to be posted after this video here drops, so stay tuned for that. However, in a nutshell, the tracks are all made out of cast white metal, and here you get to see what they look like right here. In addition to the tracks, we also have a nice set of metal sprockets. This is probably going to be replacing the kit ones, and actually I can tell you straight up, they are going to be replacing the kit ones because, wow, the kit ones are super duper rudimentary compared to the ones here on the Fruly. So yeah, <laughs> right off the bat, the Fruly ones are definitely going to be the way to go. It's going to be interesting to see how I pair them with the model when the construction starts, but as for the links themselves, if anyone has ever seen any of the Fruly links I've mentioned in the past, it's the same type of quality. They're casted in a lead-based white metal alloy, which does have some pros and cons to it, which I'll be going over in the actual review video of these tracks. So, again, stay tuned for that. But regardless, these here are definitely going to make this model so much more improved compared to using the stock systems. At the bottom of the box, we have here, besides the instructions, which I'll touch upon in a moment, some other extra add-ons. Here's the set of photo watch that I referenced earlier. The set contains several panels of what appears to be diamond plate floorboards, as well as also a little strip here of rifling, and this is something that I'm definitely going to be touching upon as the video goes on, so stay tuned for that. The, the photo watch, I will say, again, decent quality. I have had some good luck with the photo watch supplied on other trumpeter kits that I built in the past, and you know, this one here should be similar. On the back portion, we also have a little length here of string. So it's gonna be interesting to see what exactly that is for. And on the very bottom of the box here, we have a set of water slide decals. Typical modern era printed decals on blue paper. I've also had some excellent results with these on past builds as well, and I'm anticipating similar results with this one here. So this leads us to the instruction manual. Quite typical for a trumpeter kit. If anyone has ever worked on these kits before, you'll know exactly what you're getting into. Uh, this is a bit of a surprise. This is the first time, by the way, I've even cracked these instructions open, and there you can see a excellent little color illustration of the B4 Howitzer itself. This is something that Trumpeter does do quite often, and honestly, these illustrations are so nice, you could probably just, you know, frame them and hang them in your shop for just a little bit of extra, you know, art to hang on the wall. The instructions for the construction are, you know, quite standard. This is a fairly complex kit. There are a lot of parts on this one here. And you can tell just by just the weight of the instructions, how many pages there are. This is one you're going to want to take your time with. So you don't want, you want to pump your brakes, not rush ahead and just, you know, plow your way through. Yeah, this, this is one you're going to want to take your time with and build accordingly, I should say. As I always mention, if there's a snafu or an error in the instructions, I'm definitely going to be mentioning them as the video goes on. Yeah, we could just rule this garbage out. That's not going to be used on this build. But it's interesting to see how the assembly goes together. It's very similar to like an old Caterpillar tractor, like a Caterpillar 60, but you know, that's a topic for another video for another day. And there you go. So, let me go ahead and actually start snipping off bits of plastic. While the model is going through its construction, one thing I noticed about this build, and it's not too surprising, is that this build is going to require lots of sub-assemblies to assemble. This is true for the frame, it's true for the carriage, it's true for the, the main assembly itself. Lots of sub-assemblies. And some sub-assemblies are going to require pre-paint work prior to just final assembly and then installation to the piece. Case in point, we have right here are the pontoons for the suspension. So there are two of these on the model. The other one is still over here, found on the sprues. And with the way these units are designed is that once everything is assembled, it self-contains all the suspension components. Much along the lines like you would see, for instance, on like an excavator, you know, comes to mind. However, uh, while the parts are really easily assembled, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. The one thing that does come to mind though is that 
you, once the units get glued in place or uh, you know assembled, you're not going to be able to get into these inner recesses, and it's going to be impossible to get these units thoroughly painted. So, just like I frequently mention on other builds that are similar in nature, as you can see, everything was pre-primed and painted prior to the units being assembled. The units are easily painted at this point. Note, even on the wheels here, I even painted the steel rims on the tires. Because, as you can see from this side here, you're not going to be able to get in here once the pontoons are fully assembled. And, although some people say, yeah, but you can't see them anyway, yeah, you kind of can. This is These are going to be one of those type of things where, it depends on the, on the angle you're holding the model, it just always happens this way. You will get a blind spot that pops out of bare naked plastic and it's just, it, it never looks good. Or you're going to see the brush stroke end for the steel wheel as opposed to going all the way around. And either way are not beneficial to your build. So for this one here, as you can see, I went ahead and pre-painted the interior sections as well as the, the steel tires prior to the thing going to final assembly. So this one here is actually ready for that. One other thing I want to mention about the return, uh, I should say the front idler specifically, is that the idler on this vehicle, the tolerances are very, very, very snug. So much so that when I inserted the piece in place, I went to fiddle around with it to shift it, and the little stem literally just snapped right off. And this was easily remedied by just drilling a hole through everything with a pin vise and putting a steel wire in place, which keeps it B. This is really the best way to fix it. If you just try gluing it in place, it's not going to hold or it's not going to sit right. It, it never works out all that well. So the steel rod is the best way to do it. Fortunately, where this is located on the model, there's going to be a cover piece that gets fixed over this location over here, which on the real unit is actually the, oddly enough, the, the, idler, attention, or, uh, the idler tension spring system. But that's something that's going to be concealed, so this little piece protruding here is not going to be a problem once the model progresses past this point. But again, this was something I did want to mention. On this one over here, I'm probably going to open up the tolerances a little bit with a pin vise, just so that, you know, the piece slides into place and it doesn't cause any other issues. For the sprockets, these appear to be free spinning, so this is something I'm not going to put the steel on at this point, and it's something I could just dry brush onto the piece as the model progresses, you know, towards the finish line. Regardless, though, I am definitely going to make sure that the piece can free spin after my experience here with the or the front idler section of the build, where this is very, very relevant, is with not only the main assembly itself. Where, by the way, the paint that I used actually came out really, really nice. I really dig this color and I dig this paint. Of course, I'm going to be circling back to this, uh, you know, at the tail end of the video when I go over the paint work. But regardless, it's good stuff. Uh, the whole unit was assembled and was also pre-primed prior to the assembly. The primer does twofold for this type of setup over here. First, you know, you need something for the paint to stick to, obviously. But the second thing was just to make sure that all of the seams have been removed. And this thing is going to be an exercise in seam removal. Basically, every single component from every single cylinder that we have right here are separate assemblies. There are two piece assemblies and they all get glued together, which means seam, 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 seam. Uh, same thing with the main breech over here, multi-part assembly seems to contend with. So all of this is something that needs to be contended with prior to the thing even going remotely near paint. And the best way to do that is you, you know, you, you sand everything down with some sandpaper or needle file or, you know, you do whatever you need to do. And then you pre prime everything prior to even the pieces getting affixed to one another. This is just to ensure that the seams are thoroughly removed to make sure there's no surprises because, you know, when the unit is, you know, in this condition here and you go to paint the next thing you know you have seams popping up, it's really going to ruin your day because now you have to try to blend that in and it's, it's best left, you know, best done taken care of before the unit gets assembled than afterwards, needless to say. At the moment, the rifling has not been installed in place. It's going to be added shortly after I filmed this scene here, but as you can see, everything is nice and thoroughly blended away with the seam removal techniques that I frequently reference. On the front section over here, this, you know, jumping ahead a little bit, this area here required a bit of sculpting with the way the piece goes together. The front cone here wasn't really that uh, symmetrical, and so a bit of sandpaper and uh, sculpting was required in order to go ahead and file it down to the way that we have it here. And that's just, you know, with the way this kit is designed. And I believe they do this so that the end can be hollow for the the, the rifling. But once the unit is fully polished down, though, it yields for some very good results, I find. So 
the last thing that's similar in nature to this is of course the carriage itself. If anyone have ever seen my NAS horn or my Hummel build videos, this is basically, you know, copy paste. The inner portions over here are thoroughly primed and painted prior to the unit getting assembled with the way the all of these type of systems are. The unit just plugs together and then once it's plugged in place and things are glued together, you're not gonna be able to take it apart. And obviously, yeah, you're gonna get a lot of areas in here that you're just not gonna be able to get access to once everything is fully assembled. So again, pre-prime, pre-paint prior to final assembly. At this point here, the only thing I need to install is the pinion gear, which goes in this section over here that has been painted off camera. The only thing I gotta do is just paint the silver sections for the gear tooth. Same thing for this guy over here. And then this bad boy here can go into final assembly and then I could progress with the remainder of the build. P.S. One other thing, I cannot recommend enough for this build that'll make your job and your life so much easier. And this is actually true for a lot of other builds, but for this build over here, oh boy, did I use these guys on overtime. Is this little bucket over here I got from Tractor Supply of these small little spring clips. These things were instrumental in making sure that many of the two half assemblies were crimped properly in place, allowing for the adhesives to set. And basically every single round unit that was a two-piece assembly on this model at one point had these clamps fitted in place. These are excellent. They were cheap. It was like, I got this whole bucket for like five bucks or so. And these things here can be found anywhere from Amazon to uh, Harbor Freight. I, like I said, I picked these up in the you know bargain tool bin in my local tractor supply. So I cannot recommend these enough. And these are awesome, by the way, for all plastic model builds, but on the uh, howitzer over here, oh yeah, yeah, I cannot recommend them enough. These things really did come to be very, very handy. As the build continues, here we have the main section over here, fully assembled and it's actually ready for painting. However, before I'm going to go ahead and slide into paint, I do want to touch upon a couple things that I personally noticed on this kit, and it's actually probably the biggest ding that this kit does indeed have. So jumping directly into it, it involves these two shields that we have here and here. These shields are actually the seats, or I should say the backrests for the two crew members that would sit into this section over here when the unit is in either operation or when it's being in its transport type setting. And this kit is very nicely detailed in the way everything assembles together. It's a pretty elaborate bit of components and they do go together very well and they are well illustrated in the instructions. Bearing a few small little hand fit items here there, like for instance on the little armrests over here, they plug into the backrest supports. However, the little peg that's molded into the armrest is just slightly too long by just like a hair. So basically with the clean cut set, you snip off the two little pegs slightly and then the piece will fit into place much more easily without any need for extra effort. So that's definitely something I recommend to do. But the biggest ding is actually a design wise that was done with the kit. And that involves the shield that we have here. So on the shield, there are these two holes that are found molded into the back section over here. And this is so that this headrest here or it can plug directly into it. Unfortunately, with the way the kit is designed, you do have these two unsightly large holes that are found molded into these two sections. And this is a very prominent fact. I argue it's probably the, one of the most eye-catching bits on the entire model. And now you have these very large unsightly holes that are not supposed to be there. So this needs to be addressed with a little bit of bodywork. The problem is, is that the bodywork in this section over here needs to be very, very, very selective. And by selective, I'm really meaning surgical. Because if you look at this one here, which is already in its primer, you can see that there are these little rivets that are integrally molded in. And these giant holes, which you can see on this one over here, are basically right in the way of those tiny little rivets. So trying to get in there with some sandpaper is going to be very, very, very difficult. Not impossible, obviously I was able to do it on these two examples, but it's something that definitely was not very fun. The way I did it was I first tried the technique with the super glue, which did the trick, but then I also went there with a little smear of red putty in order to finish it off. The sandpaper, I basically just folded up into a tiny little point, like you see right there, and this I was able to just go in there and just polish away these two little areas and you have to really pay attention because if you hit those little tiny little nubs of which are the rivet detailing it's just going to annihilate it and trying to replace those is going to be very very difficult so this is definitely something that is 
needs to be addressed and paid attention to by the builder when they're going through the motions. Uh, it would have been better, in my opinion, if they would have did it in reverse, where on the back, on this metal section over here, they would have had two little pegs, and then the holes would have been found on this headrest, so that would have indexed in, in that manner. Uh, that would have been a much better solution compared to the way Trumpeter did it, but alas, the way you see it here is the way it's done. So if you're building this kit, you will have to do bodywork on these sections over here, unless you're going to have some really unsightly holes here found on probably one of the most prominent sections on the model, and it definitely does detract from the look of it. Other things to pay attention to are several injection pin marks that are found on the bottom portions here of these components. These are somewhat visible on the model even when it's complete and to remove them this is easily done with the various techniques such as an exacto knife some sandpaper or a needle file just rub it up and down those sections over there with the various bits of equipment that i just mentioned and all of those will be able to polish everything down so with that out of the way that's really all there is to mention um one other thing i do want to mention at this time are the spools in these sections over here they currently do not have the cable detailing added this is going to be done after the model is painted but while i'm on this section over here you'll notice that the sections here are not the kit original the kit originally supplies you with these very frail little thin plastic rods that need to be sipped off the runner cleaned and then secured in place and these are the type of things that are very very frail and are not uncommonly snapped during the course of production so on which was the case on this one over here so i just simply replace them with some pieces of metal floor wire which easily dropped in where the kit one once was. If you're building this kit and you're going through the motions here, don't be surprised if the pieces break on you. If you're able to get the whole model built without the pieces breaking on you, God bless, <laughs> you you uh, you know uh, did well. Uh, but if they do, fear not, the sizes are very, very commonly seen in floor wire. So it's a simple swap out if slash when the need does arise. Starting with the most iconic and characteristic part on the entire unit and that is its tracked pontoon type suspension. So with the unit now fully completed you really get to appreciate it in its final form. As I mentioned earlier this is the type of assembly that's best pre-painted prior to final assembly because now that you see it in its completed format trying to get paint into these areas over here is going to be very difficult if not impossible. So save yourself some grief and just go ahead and pre-paint it before the final assembly. Also, on this part here, you get to see the replacement track now fitted in place. As I mentioned earlier, there's no way in hell I was going to utilize the stock individual Lincoln Link tracks, and they were promptly replaced with a set of metal links from Fruly. The Fruly links are absolutely awesome. They really enhance this build, and in my opinion, are a must-have bit of equipment. The Fruly links give you both the track but they also give you a set of replacement sprockets i am going to go over in more depth about this in the actual track link review video but needless to say if you're building this model here and you are going to swap out the stock track with the frilly ones which again highly recommended but keep in mind you are also going to have to swap out the sprocket the stock sprocket are not compatible with the frilly links so you will have to pop this unit apart in order to get the new sprocket fitted in place this is why if you're building one of these units, just go with the Fruly from the get-go, and you'll be able to assemble the model with much less headache. Because of the track's white metal construction, they will have the natural sag to them, as one would expect to find, and in the right locations, on the actual unit. And the best part is, the builder has to do nothing in order to accomplish this. You just build the links, no coercion, no fiddling, nothing. Build the links, install them on the model, make sure they're the right length, and huzzah, you will have the appropriate track sag that one would expect. And because the tracks are workable, and, and I know someone's going to be asking this in the comment section, but yes, you can actually push the model across the floor if one so desires. Now, this is something that's never going to be done with this model over here, but you know, there are some people out there that would be interested to know this little detail, and this actually does have some usage to it, believe it or not. There are lots of people out there that do micro 135th scale RC conversions, and there are prime movers for this type of system that we have here. If you are the type of person that RC converts one of those, you could have it towing one of these type of artillery pieces, and because the tracks are metal and are workable, you could have this thing being towed behind your prime mover, and the tracks will articulate absolutely perfectly. So that is something to keep in mind for someone that is into that type of a model build. And on the topic of articulation, the pontoons do have some form-fitting 
nature to them. And this was just done with the out-of-the-box configuration. No real fiddling or changing was done in order to get the units to do what you see here. This is great because, one, it lends for some nice extra functionality to the piece, but also this is great is if you are working on a diorama type setting, which is something I definitely recommend for this kit, by the way, is a, you know something I'm going to touch upon later in the video. But regardless, if you are the type of person that's into making dioramas, the form-fitting nature of the suspension here is awesome because you can have it fit and contour to uneven terrain, and it'll make for a very nice, interesting display. Moving back takes us to this collapsible blade that we have here. On the real unit, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this hinges downward and digs into the ground so that when the unit is fired, it absorbs the recoil and it prevents the thing from rolling backward. On the model here, it's actually very nicely rendered where we have a multi-part assembly that has some excellent molded details on all the sides. You have lots of rivets on this piece, and that's true for the rest of the frame that I'll touch upon in a second, but the part can be molded to, or I should say the part can be assembled where it can be functional. And that's basically what I did over here. However, the parts are so fiddly that I'm not gonna mess with it on camera. The way this thing is actually held in place is with these two hooks found on either side, and there's a, obviously a mirror image on the reverse side of the model. This is actually just held in place with the hook. If I carefully try to wiggle this piece loose, the thing will actually unhinge and will rotate here on this system and pivot all the way to the rear. I was able to do this during construction. However, uh, right now I tried just messing with it off camera and it's the type of thing that will easily break if I try to mess with it. These parts here are all made out of plastic and they're very finely and fiddly molded. So don't be surprised if you're working on your piece and you accidentally break the hook or something like that. If that happens, don't worry about it. Just replace it with some metal wire and the piece will actually be better in that regard. If you are watching this and you actually want to have the piece function and work, you might as well just skip the plastic parts altogether and just scratch build new ones out of metal. It will definitely work out better in the long run. And on the reverse side of the carriage, we have here the hoist. The hoist on this example is rendered in the transport mode where it's collapsed and locked in its travel locks, tucked in the, into the side. If this unit is being rendered for firing mode, this would have to be positioned upward as this hoist is what's used to help the crews position the heavy shells and propellant bags onto the little carriages, which will help with the loading. The kit component is nicely rendered because it is made out of a multi-part assembly, but the kit does not really give you the option to render it in the deployed state. There is a pulley on this section over here, however, there is no way to hook up any sort of ropes or wire to it in order to have it in its rigged position. If the builder does want to render it in that type of format, they are going to have to make some slight modifications to the model in order to have this piece position both vertically and also with the rigging in place. It's not impossible, but it is something that the builder is going to have to go a little bit extra outside of the kit confines in order to accomplish. On the rear portion of the trail, we have the remaining two wheels, and these are very nicely rendered with the kit. Like I showed earlier, they are a multi-part assembly, and what's cool about them is that Trumpeter didn't phone this part in where they could just have the rubber tire just molded into the wheel and call it a day. They actually went ahead and rendered this as an actual rubber piece, which is fantastic. The molding on the rubber is excellent. I absolutely love the thread pattern that are present. And with the way the wheels go together are super simple and they go together without any sort of issues. The one thing I do want to mention though, is that if you are building one of these, you don't want to go ahead and pre-assemble the wheels prior to painting. Basically you paint the wheel sections off of the model unassembled, do all the weathering, all that good stuff. And then at the very tail end, you glue everything together, leading for the result that you see here. By doing this, this is the best way to avoid any sort of overspray onto the rubber sections, and it just makes for a nice, cleaner piece overall. The remainder of the carriage goes together pretty easily as well. There is a little stanchion in the back right over here, and like I stated before, this is not just for transport mode, but it's also for its static type configuration. If I was rendering this where it's being towed, this stanchion here would have to be tucked in and folded away, much along the lines as you see on any trailer. With the way the kit is, I believe it does have the option of being rendered in either the deployed or retracted state, but this is something that's up to the discretion of the builder on exactly what are they going to do with this artillery piece. So this is one of those builds where you want to have a vision in mind on exactly how you want to render it. In the transport mode, in the standing still mode, or even in the deployed state. 
all those different positions in between can be built and rendered by the builder with some degree of changes that need to be made onto the model. Another thing I also want to mention on the rear carriage is that on the real unit, these wheels here can pivot. However, once the model is built, it does not have this option or capability in place. If this is something that the builder wants to have rendered on their example, they are going to have to leave the confines of the kit and do some extra modification and scratch building. This is something that can be done, but it is going to add a little bit more fragility and a little bit extra work to the build overall. Again, this is something that's best left up to discretion of the builder. However, even though the wheels can pivot, the one thing that the carriage can do is pivot out of the way, as you can see demonstrated right here. Now, I'm not sure if it would do this in the firing mode or if the piece would just disconnect like it would on the American 8-inch howitzers, but this is something to keep in mind. And the hinging just happens naturally with the basic out-of-the-box configuration and components. And that's it for the chassis, and this brings us to the frame itself. And the frame on this model here is a substantial component. It is comprised of a mosaic of sub-assemblies, which yields for some very excellent detailing. The piece is very finely rendered out with lots and lots and lots of rivets. And with the way the thing is built, oops, I'll touch upon that later, you can see exactly how all the rivets are present in all the various locations. Now, one thing that you do need to pay attention to as the builder is that because of all the sub-assemblies, there are lots of seams to contend with on just the frame alone. And this is something that needs to be addressed by the builder because where there's two half assemblies, there's seam work. Normally the seam work is fairly easily polished away with some super glue or some putty and some sandpaper, needle file and what have you. And that is still true for this one over here. However, there are some locations where you have rivets on either side and these are very finely molded. And these are the type of things that can be lost with collateral damage when you're doing your body work. So this is probably the biggest hurdle on this kit here. And it's the one aspect where the builder really needs to pay attention to. If you're able to you know, navigate the waters appropriately though, the frame will be an absolutely gem on the build. And it's probably one of the best aspects of the kit, which is saying a lot because this kit does have a lot of really nice things going for it. One other thing I want to mention about the frame is that there are some components that are optional and you do have one or two configurations to choose from. That was definitely the case for this plate that we have over here. There were two styles and this was the one that I had chosen for this example. While on the top takes us to the shell that we have right here. There's a small little mount for the shell and this shell here just plugs directly into place without any sort of problems. You'll notice that the shells I went ahead and painted completely different compared to the remainder of the unit. And this is just done to give the model just that much more character. For the shells themselves, I went ahead and did some research on the internet and found exactly how do these Soviet shells look like. And so I went ahead and painted them accordingly. This is the same type of paint that I've used on a few other Russian builds in the past. And it's actually the same paint that I've seen on both Russian ammo cans as well as other Russian spam cans. So it's not surprising that they will utilize the same type of paint on their artillery shells. In addition to painting the shell, you'll see that the fuse is painted in silver and also the barrel band here is painted with a swipe of brass or gold paint. All these are done, again, following true to form to the real examples that I was researching and it just yields for some just nice extra paint work that definitely helps the build glow overall. Moving forward takes to the shell area here and this is another location where the builder does have some options available on how to render the model. There are two types of floors that are present. One is just all made out of timbers and the other one is this cage setup that we have right here. I went obviously with the cage one because it just lends itself for some nice extra detailing and the cage is unique because it allows these two little carriages to plug in place. However, the fit on these components are less than ideal. The Little carriages are actually a very elaborate bit of detailing themselves. It's a multi-part assembly, as I may have touched upon before. And they go together f uh, fairly well. They're a bit fiddly, but once together, they do the job. However, there is some hand fitting that's going to be required to the cage, as well as also to the carriages to get everything to fit appropriately. On the carriage itself, the wheels are actually too spaced out. And because of that, they're not going to fit into their rails. So I actually had to do some hand fitting on the components after everything was painted, no less, in order to get them to fit in place. This is something that was fairly easily done, but it's something that, you know, can throw a 
builder for a loop specifically if they're working on these for the first time. And if they are someone that doesn't really have their skill sets ironed out, this is going to be a bit of a problem for them. On a similar note, if memory serves, I believe the frame being able to drop down into the frame over here was also a bit problematic with its fitting. And again, some hand fitting was also required to be done in order to get the model built to the appearance that you have here. But if you're able to navigate those waters, yeah, the piece will be able to be assembled. And once completed, you get the results that you see on my example. Moving forward brings us to the main star of the show, which is the howitzer itself. As I mentioned before, this is a multi-part assembly, and basically every inch of this thing is a two-part assembly, which means seams, seams, seams. Seam work was all polished away with the various techniques that I've touched upon before in other videos, as well as in this video. And once everything is assembled, this is the final end result. So, like I referenced before, you need to pre-prime, or I should say it's a good idea to pre-prime all these locations before final assembly, just to make sure that there are no hidden surprises that await you. If everything is appropriately polished away, the end result will be one that has a lot of nice detailing to it and also some really cool geometry. Also, as I mentioned before, the unit can be able to be fully elevated or depressed and no modifications need to be made to the kit in order to do this. Once everything is fully assembled, you can see just how easily everything is able to go up and down. However, to go up and down, you do have to have one thing in mind, and that is with this little plate that we have right here. This unit connects to the front portion of the howitzer and also plugs into a little location on the side plate here. And if you're going through the build, you may be tempted to just glue everything in place, you know, just going through the motions. And if you do that, you kneecap yourself and you're not going to be able to get the thing to function. On this model over here, basically I just made sure that the tolerances were uh, loose enough where the piece can fit into place without falling out and the piece can still pivot. And once everything is completed, as you can see, the functionality is unhindered by any sort of equipment. I like the way Trumpeter rendered the gear mechanism, how it just interlocks and meshes absolutely perfectly. And again, it's just a very nicely engineered piece in that regard. The only thing the builder has to pay attention to, again, is just this little piece over here. With the camera brought in, you get to see the gear up close. And as I mentioned before, both faces of the pinion gear and the main gear here were painted in silver, as this would be true to form on the real one. And paint on these locations would wear off very, very quickly, or you just wouldn't have paint on them at all. Obviously, these pieces need to function very fluidly, and a coat of paint could potentially, you know, gum up the work. So on the model over here, I just, you know, went with the little brush of silver paint as you've seen on this example. This is true to form, by the way, not just this example, but all the other artillery and self-propelled type units that I've built on this channel in the past. It's a common technique, and it's one that always yields for some nice results. Plus, it gives a nice little bit of color to the model to boot. On the front portion over here takes us these two spools. I already referenced this location earlier in the video, but now you get to see what it looks like with the little wire that is added in place. The kit originally supplies you with some string, but I replaced those with the thin metal floor wire because this does a better job, in my opinion, of replicating steel cable as opposed to the string that's supplied with the kit. The pieces were just spooled up into the locations that we have here, and once everything is painted and weathered, you know, it definitely looks the job. Well, I shouldn't say painted because this is actually the natural in the white color of the wire itself, but I did go ahead and add the weathering agents to them in order to give you the look that you see here. Moving up takes to the crew seats, and as I mentioned before, the back sections had to have some bodywork on them in order to delete the holes that were present in place. And with everything deleted and blended away, you get to see how the end result looks. And this is, in my opinion, a very prominent location on this model. So going through the extra work with doing the extra bodywork is definitely one that will yield for some excellent results in its final outcome. On the reverse side, you get to see what the crew section looks like fully completed. As I mentioned before, these are all the kit supply parts, and they went together pretty well, but they are very fiddly molded, so the builder needs to, again, take care with removing the parts off of the sprue, deburring them, and then also with the sub-assemblies that are required. If you go ahead and take your time and you do things appropriately, you should be able to utilize the kit parts without any sort of problems. Same is true for not just this location, but the location found here on the reverse side. Also found in this location are the two photo etch platforms that are found in these areas. And the photo etch was a very nice choice of material. It yields for some very excellent, crisp 
detailing. However, one thing that the builder has to pay attention to is the alignment. You see these pieces here do not have any sort of pegs or holes or anything like that to indicate exactly where the piece goes on and the builder literally has to use their eye to make sure that the parts line up accordingly. It's pretty easily done but it's definitely something that you know you need to pay attention to. Also in order to help the parts stick together I recommend hitting the reverse side with some sandpaper just to add some texture to that area which will definitely aid with the gluing making sure that the parts will stay in their locations and stay in their locations in a nice strong manner. On the topic of the photo wedge you can also see the PE found right here on these side sections and again these just went on without any sort of problems just following the kit's components as well as the kit's instructions for that matter. Moving our way to the business end takes us to the muzzle section. As I mentioned before the seam work was a crucial bit of work that was required on this section but also with the shape of the muzzle itself it did require a little bit of hand fitting in order to get everything blended to the format that you see here. But also at this point now you get to see what it looks like hopefully with the camera focused in with the rifling insert that I mentioned before. The rifling insert was one that bent pretty easily. I recommend finding a dowel or a rod of some sort that has the appropriate shape and then you could use this as a jig in a form to roll the photo wedge around. Once you have the right shape it just slips directly into the appropriate location here found on the kit. The other thing to mention is just a little bit of body work found on the two areas where they meet. Just a little drop of super glue or red putty I believe. No, I use super glue on this one. Once it's set, I just carefully polish it down with some sandpaper, leaving for the end result that you see here. If you are going with any sort of seam removal type procedure, you want to be aware not to make sure obviously any of that crud gets on the inside because then it's going to clunk up the rifling and it's going to basically be counteractive on what you're actually trying to achieve. So bear that in mind and you should have some pretty good results. And that's all there is to mention about the detailing. This brings us to the paintwork. For the model's paintwork, I actually went with a slightly different format compared to the other models I brought onto this table. First, the model was still thoroughly primed with El Cheapo flat black spray paint. That is a constant and something that I will always do. However, for the main base coat itself, rather than going with my exterior latexes, I went with the acrylics from Mission Models. The Mission Models paints are a type of paints I've been messing around with on my recent builds for good reason. They have some excellent color choices and the paints are really good quality. The base coat was applied via the airbrush and then I went ahead and added the filters and the washes bringing up to the condition that you see here. The Mission Models paint is a excellent paint however you do have to use varnish onto the surface in order to preserve it and to protect it specifically from moisture. The paint is very water soluble and that's something that you really have to pay attention to specifically if you utilize acrylic washes and also if you're applying the water slide decals. It's kind of uh, a problem if the water slide decals are being applied to a, a surface that has paint that is very susceptible to moisture. So the varnish is the usual brand that I've touched upon on many other videos which is the VMS matte varnish. I absolutely love that stuff and I'm always buying it from the guy. He's, he's a great vendor and I recommend the varnish for anyone who's building plastic models regardless of the subject matter. They are excellent quality and I definitely am not looking back. The, the, I should say the varnish is applied via the airbrush and then at least for the final end result that you see here. The model does also have my standard chipping and dry brushing techniques that I also touch upon in my other videos. And on the markings front, you'll notice that this model does not have any sort of markings. The model does give you a set of water slides. However, for this one here, I wanted to just go with the standard type configuration. The water slides basically just have slogans to be painted onto the barrel and looked, in my opinion, a little bit gaudy just for the example that I just wanted to render. So for this one here, it's absolutely markingless in the following configuration. If I ever get another one, I probably would you know, mix it up by putting on red stars or the other markings that are supplied. But for this one here, I just wanted to go with the less is more type effect that you see presently. For the track paint work, because the links are made out of metal and are not either single piece vinyl or plastic workable link, they are absolutely impervious to the harsher paints that are out there. So for these tracks here, I painted them with the same type of Rust-Oleum dark gray primer spray paint that I've touched upon in my Armortech build videos and also several of my RC116 videos. 
The paint is an excellent choice for this type of medium because it greatly replicates the look of the parkerization color or the oxide coating that are generally found on track links from this era. Normally to get an effect like this with standard flat black Tamiya, I would have to do some other effects that are added afterwards. But for these tracks over here with that paint, it's ready to go out of the can. Just apply it, let it dry, and you're done with the basic color. The remainder of the weathering on this one here is just dry brushing. And this is again, done with the same techniques that I've touched upon in many of my weapon tutorial videos that are found on the channel as well. And at the end of the day, I couldn't be any happier in how this build turned out. I am absolutely thrilled at the final end result. This was nearly a perfect build for me. The B4 howitzer was always one of those vehicle types, like I stated earlier, that I always wanted to have in my collection in one way, shape, or form, or another. And also, in addition, this model here, like I mentioned earlier, was an old stash inhabitant and was sitting in the stash for over 10 years. So finally getting to this one and crossing it off the to-do list is definitely a very rewarding experience. However, in a way, I'm actually kind of glad that it took me this long to get to this model here because if I would have built it back when the model was first procured, chances are really good it would not have turned out nearly as good as it does now. So my painting and weathering techniques have definitely evolved in the past decade, or at least I hope they have. And having the model now built in the condition that we have here, in my opinion, it's definitely a weight that was one that worked out for the best. And as usual, this is the perfect point to pivot us into skill level and recommendation. So right out of the breach, if you are a beginner builder, the type of person who's never even touched a plastic model kit before, or have built maybe one or two simple kits in the past, this is absolutely not going to be the kit for you. No way, Jose. This model here is very complex, and for someone that has very limited skill sets, it's just going to lead to disaster. Like many of the other kits on this channel that have been reviewed in the past, this model here, in my opinion, is firmly meant for someone who's an intermediate to an advanced range type person. If you have your basic skill sets fully ironed out and squared away, this kit here becomes a viable option for you. As I mentioned before, this kit does have lots of sub-assemblies to it, and many of these sub-assemblies require bodywork and seam removal. These are the type of skill sets that you really need to have in your pocket in order to successfully build one of these and have a good go-ahead at doing so. In addition to that, there are lots of pinpoint surgical seam removal areas found on the chassis. And as I mentioned before, with all the rivets that this thing does have, the builder really has to pay attention to be very careful with the type of polishing that you're gonna to need to do because one little slip and you're gonna potentially harm the detail finish on the model. Also, as I mentioned before, many of the smaller components that are found on this model over here are very frail and can easily be broken if the right amount of care is not exhibited by the builder. In addition to that, several of the components, even though the fit is pretty good, there is some slight hand fitting here or there that can be made to some of the components in order to make them fit better. This is the type of skill sets here that a beginner will not have and an intermediate should basically have under their belt. Obviously, if you are an advanced builder, this kit here can be recommended all day long. But of course, this goes true for all of the people who are interested in picking up this kit. If you're buying this model, in my opinion, the stock individual Lincoln Link tracks need to go. Don't even, even humor the idea of using them and just replace them straight up with the set of Frulies. Yes, the Frulies will contribute more to the cost of the model. However, the quality and the easy construction, not to mention the enjoyability of the build, all skyrocket through the roof. In addition to the tracks, there are a few other aftermarket components that are out there on the market, and all these can be added to this model here to improve the detail fidelity and also to take it from the condition that you see here. However, as I often mention in these videos, this is best left up to the discretion of the builder if they deem the costs and the extra complexity are worth it. In my opinion, the model builds excellently with the out-of-the-box components. The only thing that needs to be swapped out are just the tracks. With the tracks swapped out, the model more or less is basically what you're looking for. In addition to that, Trumpeter themselves also have several aftermarket sets that are for this kit over here. Not so much aftermarket, but more or less accessories. Things such as the crew and even 
the other vehicles out there that this thing would be towed with. From several examples of the Soviet copy of the Caterpillar tractor to even a few other dedicated Russian military prime movers, all those are out there on the market in 135th scale and all those can contribute greatly to the overall display that anyone can have in store with this model over here. And that's all there really is to be mentioned about that, which brings us to recommendations. First, if you're just a fan of Russian armor or Russian military vehicles or just World War II Russian equipment in general, this kit here is a no-brainer for you. You will enjoy every moment of it and it will do nothing but enhance your collection. Another person I'd recommend this kit to is anyone who's just an avid fan of artillery pieces. That is like its own little subset group in the armor modeling racket. If you're the type of person that has the Long Tom, the 88, several versions of the other German World War II heavy artillery pieces, the B4 here is one that will fit in swimmingly in your collection. Another type of person who I'd recommend this kit to is the type of person that loves to make diorama scenes. Now, basically, this is true for just about every model kit on the market. You can make a diorama just about everything and people have. However, this vehicle here is one that definitely lends itself to this type of a usage just because of how unique and bizarre the subject matter is. This thing here has so much intricate detailing on it and just with the subject matter itself, it will really enhance any type of scene that is placed in. With this type of vehicle here, you could definitely use it for a Battle of Berlin type scene where it's either blowing the hell out of a building or you can have some, you know, German or Russian infantry, you know, advancing or retreating or what have you. All those ideas would be great to work around this type of a artillery piece that we have here. Not to mention all the other usage that the Soviets did with this thing during the war. So again, it's a very rich vehicle for diorama settings. However, the story for this one is just going to end up like the other models that you see on this channel where it gets placed in its nice little dustproof plastic box and placed in the collection on display with the other models. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale B4 and 1931 203mm howitzer. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop a new post of content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as photographs of the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.